In 2006, Shelby Steele described a dramatic shift, then rapidly changing in America. That's 15 years ago. But his book, White Guilt, How Blacks and Whites Together Destroyed the Promise of the Civil Rights Era, has still got a lot to tell us today. In a time when it seems that the top leaders in the country, political leaders, are doing their utmost to pour gasoline on the fire of, to create racial uh, animus in the country, just we're talking total insanity here. Uh, in a time like that, this can be very useful. Let's look at a couple pieces here. Steele starts out by talking about how social morality came, became transcendent over individual morality in America. Now, he's going to describe two different ways of doing things here. In a democracy, the legitimacy of institutions and of government itself is earned and sustained through fidelity to a discipline of democratic principles. These principles strive to ensure the ennobling conditions that free societies aspire to. Freedom for the individual, the same rights for all individuals, equality under the law, equality of opportunity, and an inherent right to life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. Freedom, then, is not a state-imposed vision of the social good, say, a classless society. Rather, it is the absence of any imposed vision that would infringe on the rights and freedom of individuals. In a true democracy, freedom is a higher priority than the social good. Now, then he goes on, that's 10, page 11, uh, he talks about this. In totalitarian or feudal societies, legitimacy and moral authority basically amount to, he says, they're not a discipline of principles, but to the grand vision at the center of the ideology or to the king. Free societies become more like these unfree societies when they decide that some social good is so important that it justifies suspending freedom's discipline of principles. There's a key insight there as he opens the book. When we move away from the principles of freedom, to putting some big idea, a supposedly good idea, at the center of everything, we're going to wind up smashing freedom. You can be sure of it. So on page 24, he describes white guilt. It's very something very specific. The vacuum of moral authority that comes from simply knowing that one's race is associated with racism. That's what he says it is. And he says it's the same thing as black power. We'll see how that is here in a moment. On page 27, he mar remarks this, because white guilt is a vacuum of moral authority, it makes the moral authority of whites and the legitimacy of American institutions contingent on proving a negative, that they're not racist. This is beginning to give us insight already into things we're seeing, uh, how quickly the universities and these big institutions are uh, rolling over immediately, instantly, to be diverse and to give priority to, to what they call equity, which is not equality. It doesn't mean equality of opportunity, it means equality of outcome. And so you shift everything on the, along the way so you can get equality of outcome, and that's a problem. Now the author reminds us that there's a big difference between the civil rights era and Martin Luther King and those, those guys, and moving towards a a uh, freedom of people apart from their uh, respect for character apart from color, come going toward color blindness to what we have today. This, this is again 15 years ago, but look what he says. The Marxian emphasis on structures and substructures gave the new, he's talking about the new ones now after this, the new militant leaders of the time an infinitely larger racism to work with, a systematic and sociological racism that was far more determinative than the simpler immoral racism of the Martin Luther era. And so he's saying that uh, there was a shift from that kind of racism, understanding racism as just general bigotry uh, and prejudice, to this idea that it's systematic, it's in everything, it's in every corporation, it's in every institution, everything is racist. Everybody that's white anyway is uh, allegedly racist down to the core. And so he says that these institutions, to prove that they're moral, to prove that they're moral in the new morality, the focus on, on social morality and being not racist. They lower people's personal responsibility. They lower the entrance requirements. They lower the standard, but they're virtue signaling that they are moral by, by doing that. And so these institutions kind of have now a vested interest in disassociating themselves from the America of the past. Uh, they want to show that they're not racist like that America of the past was. On page 33, he talks about the new, the new version of uh, civil rights, the new racism, the new... Remember, there's a big difference between the Martin Luther King era, we want colorblindness and uh, equal opportunity. There's a big difference between that and what we have now with uh, we're going to see racism everywhere, and this is what he's pointing to here. The Marxian emphasis on structures and substructures gave the new militant leaders of the time an infinitely larger racism to work with, a systematic and sociological racism that was far more determinative than the simpler immoral racism of the Martin Luther King era. And so he says that now we're looking for racism everywhere, and consequently uh, we have a shift instead of 
looking for color blindness, that's, that's passe now. That's not what we want now. Uh, we have even the state of California is, is uh, trying to get rid of uh, those safeguards so that they can be more uh, racist, so to speak, and, and be more recognizing of racial things so that then they can give preference to certain colors they want to give preference to. Oh, and it's at this spot, too, that, uh, that he anticipates D'Angelo comes up with and, and all these uh, wokest uh, critical race theory people where we are looking again for racism everywhere and it's a structural thing. White supremacy is this big structural thing permeating all of society, this mysterious interlinking that, that makes white dominance the big thing and everybody else is pushed down uh, because of it. And so uh, that's... D'Angelo's view uh, on racism is that it's permeating and it's in us and you can't get it out. It's like a stain you can't get out of anything. It's just there. In contrast, Shelby Steele is saying that uh, the issue is not bad values in America. The issue is that we didn't live them out in the early years and we finally came to that place where we uh, blacks were no longer oppressed and we're in a pretty good place. But now we're going absolutely backwards on that. And the result is devastation. Devastation to people who need to take responsibility and, and come on up to a higher level. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't taking us there. And I might add, it's not taking us toward uh, increased unity, increased fellowship uh, among the culture. Instead, it's, it's stoking tensions and creating animus and trouble. So this, this is a, a problem. I think the author points out something really useful for us on page 34. He's talking now about the shift from the Luther King era to now. For this, but for this new generation of black leaders, racism existed within a context of white guilt, within a society that suffered a vacuum of moral authority precisely because of its indulgence in racism. Thus, America and all of its institutions suddenly needed something from blacks, a people who in the past had been needed for little more than manual labor. By the mid-60s, white guilt was eliciting an entirely new kind of black leadership, not selfless men like King, who appealed to the nation's moral character, but smaller men, bargainers, bluffers, and harangers, not moralists, but specialists in moral indignation, who could set up a trade with white guilt. Racism suddenly became valuable. Very big shift, very interesting observation. And across the page, he's talking about these same leaders, and he says this, What was new for me on that night, this so-and-so, this person, was not fighting to end racism, as King had always done, he, but he was giving us the ideas we needed to enlarge it. To enlarge what? To enlarge racism. Yeah, that's the new line. We're enlarging racism. And over here on page 41, he's going to talk about Johnny Cochran and the O.J. Simpson case. Do you remember that? Some of you can remember back that when uh, we, saw, we saw them on the news driving down the freeway, the police following O.J.'s... SUV. Anyway, you, I think you remember that whole case. Johnny Cochran succeeded in making the trial a contest between the empirical evidence and global racism, between fact and the reputation of racism for distorting and manipulating fact. What he gambled on was that the court, on television before the world, would have to show itself, above all else, deferential to racism's distorting power. Though this black lawyer saw racism everywhere, he did, he did not gamble his case on the courts being racist, he gambled it on the courts being obsessed with showing its utter freedom from racial bias, its determination to let even a hint of racism disqualify sound evidence. Johnny Cochran instinctively understood that the court, an American institution in the age of white guilt, was infinitely more concerned with its own moral authority and legitimacy than with the truth. He knew, he knew the court would allow global racism to be the standard for reasonable doubt, not because it was a reasonable standard, but because it gave the court, in this trial of a, of a famous black man, much needed legitimacy where race was concerned. In sum, he knew that the court would essentially forego the evidence against Simpson simply to prove that it was not biased against Simpson. And that's an interesting observation, isn't it? And of course you know that uh, Simpson was uh, found not guilty. On page 59 he talks about how the goal is to redistribute responsibility for black uplift from blacks themselves to American institutions. In other words, you don't have to uh, come up to a higher standard. What we need to do over here is we're going to give you some freebies. We're going to give you, we're going to lower, uh, make it easier for you. We're not going to require as much of you. We're going to make it less, you'll be, have to be less responsible to get our degrees. So that's an interesting observation, again, from, from uh, Steele, the author. Page 62. Moral authority comes to institutions only when they relieve minorities of responsibility lowered standards and racial preferences, he has in parentheses here. So again, the same thing we just said. Page 67 has a really interesting paragraph about freedom. Now notice what he says about the situation for American blacks. 
The greatest black problem in America today is freedom. All underdeveloped, formerly oppressed groups first experience new freedom as a shock and a humiliation because freedom shows them their underdevelopment and their inability to compete as equals. Freedom seems to confirm all the ugly stereotypes about the group, especially the charge of inferiority. And yet the group no longer has the excuse of oppression. Without oppression, and it must be acknowledged that blacks are no longer oppressed in America, the group itself becomes automatically responsible for its inferiority and non-competitiveness. And on he goes. But anyway, that's a very interesting observation that uh, he's saying that blacks are no longer oppressed. This is written in 2006. Have things really gotten worse since then, or, or are they just getting being made worse, portrayed as worse? He says it's hard to, to come up from uh, a lower position, and it surely it is. And so um, he's not saying that, that blacks are, are less than or anything. He's saying that they need to come up, have strong standards and, and keep themselves personally responsible, as we all do, by fixing those problems. And of course, the result of that is it leaves, uh, it leaves blacks sort of as, oh, we're the poor victims. On page 69, he talks about how whites need to help blacks so that they can regain some moral legitimacy. And so they'll bend over to do every, whatever they're told to do that is needed to be, whatever accusation is made, uh, whatever uh, thing supposedly is, is a racist thing that has happened, uh, we'll bend over backwards to fix it. Why? To show that we really are upstanding moral people. And this uh, actually is, is usually turns out badly for all parties. So he sees the transfer of power then to these uh, narrow range of black activists who are saying whatever crazy thing they say, uh, much of which is, is erroneous uh, and not factual, counterfactual, like the idea that there's all these uh, people being killed by police officers, all these blacks being killed by police officers in America when when the numbers the numbers statistics surely don't show uh, any increase in that at all. It's a tiny number. It's every one of those would be sad. but you know the question is what are the facts? not what how do we want to reshape the world? Page ninety six. Wherever there is a vacuum of moral authority, there is inevitably a transfer of moral authority and therefore of power. Thus it was that John, and baby boomers generally, happened on to possibly the greatest source of political, social, and cultural power in the late 20th century, white guilt. This was the power, even the command, to invent America all over again in the interest of redeeming it. When there's a vacuum of moral authority, there's a transfer of power. When there's power transferred, then there's a lot of people that sit up and say, there's opportunities here to get the things we want. Especially if you've got your big plan, which is to remake the culture in a totally different kind of a neo-Marxist pattern. Steele has an interesting observation about white civilization on page 108, 109. The death of white authority also meant that something culturally enormous, something that had brought great cohesion and coherence to society, began to go out of the world. If white Western societies were racist and imperialistic, they were also the centers of an indisputably great civilization, one that absorbed contributions from many other races and cultures. But when white supremacy was delegitimized, whites did not simply lose the authority to practice racism. The loss of authority generalized well beyond that so that whites also lost a degree of their authority to stand proudly for the values and ideas that had made the West a great civilization despite its many evils. So the author is telling us that white civilization really has a lot of good in it in spite of what we hear and uh, in spite of the bad pieces. Yes, there are bad pieces. On page 110, after America admitted to what was worst about itself, there was not enough authority left to support what was best. He goes on to say that this uh, this problem is solved by disassociation, that uh, white institutions or the government or corporations, they want to de disassociate with anything that we have that's uh, portrayed as being white or racist or white supremacist. And so you've got these giant corporations today, of course, we see in our time, uh, forking over millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter and these other uh, operations. And of course, when they give a big, big donation, why, then they probably won't be criticized by Black Lives Matter. They won't be charged with, get the accusation of being racist. So you see how the, how the wheel turns, how it works, and how it's really a betrayal of the whole civilization by these big corporations. They shouldn't be held hostage this way, and they should, pay, should not allow this to... Uh, but, but what you have is you cannot be accused of being racist. That's the worst possible thing, because now we're in social morality instead of individual morality. So just to accuse somebody of being racist is just about enough to get their head cut off. Just a note here on this idea of white supremacy. Uh, I don't really think that's useful terminology, although it certainly permeates uh, the discussion today. But 
white supremacy, really, really. In, in, in America that's founded on the idea that, that uh, all men are created equal, created equal, they're innately equal, they have certain rights, they all have them, all of us have them. Yes, it was imperfectly lived out, certainly, with, with actual slavery, but those values, and then the, the early, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States actually supporting negative rights, you know, basically get everything out of the way, clear out, don't let the government or any other uh, thing get in the way of per anybody kind of coming up and making a personal a stand and going, um, making their life out of what they'll make it. Uh, those principles are not principles of uh, putting one race above another. Now, in, in the way it worked out for so many years, yes, that certainly was not lived up to. But this is not a white supremacist culture. Uh, this is a, a culture that, as we just read, has uh, absorbed many good things from many different cultures. So I don't like that phrase, white supremacy. Uh, I don't think it's telling us the truth. I think it's giving a, a, a distortion, a fairly dramatic distortion. And again, the way D'Angelo uses white supremacy is, you know, there's a systematic problem all through the culture. It's, it's, it, it's baked in. You can't get it out. Uh, me, I'm white, so I can't get it out. I'm just stuck with it, and of course I'm a bad guy because I'm stuck with it. Every white person is stuck with it. So Robin D'Angelo gives us this business. But Mr. Steele uses the white supremacy thing too, although his is not the same as D'Angelo. His idea of white supremacy is a much smaller version of it. Uh, but even then, I, I think that's not a useful category. It's been so abused that it, it's not helpful today. It it's sort of starts us in a, in a pool of deception and um, disorientation. It's not, it's not a de descriptively useful since it's been so twisted to begin with. So I'd stay away from that term white supremacy, but I'm sure we'll hear quite a bit of it in the years coming along. Yeah, we don't hear a lot about the greatness, the, the goodness, the principles. We don't hear a lot about the principles that, that are really good principles that this country was founded on. Really good principles. Are those things all tainted? Is that all bad stuff? Is that all passe? Is it all gone? Did it never exist? I think, I think it did exist. I think it does still exist. And to not see it is actually a blindness in itself. America's early principles of personal liberty and religious liberty, representative government, you know, fairness all around, those are good principles. Poorly implemented? Yeah. But throw it out with the bathwater? No. So on page 140, the author talks about disassociation. I think this is a pretty important uh, principle here. Basically, he's talking about how uh, to disassociate from supposed white supremacy, the, what we have is a movement away from all those early values. Again, we're kind of throwing out everything. And so what we have today is a lot of politics where people are, are throwing away. They don't want to be associated with those values that really were and are great values. And so we have uh, these giant corporations forking over, of course, you know, millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter and, and those kinds of things, virtue signaling and trying to get away, you know, we're not part of that. And so we have this uh, disassociation, we have it in politics, where the, the values of personal responsibility, those kinds of things are all set aside because now what do we got to do? Now we have to have the government get in and tell us all how to do everything. Don't worry, the government's going to fix it. We'll tell you whether you should wear a mask, stand on a dot. Uh, we'll tell you what the interest requirements should be, what your quota should be, and, and, and on and on and on it goes. And at the end of the day, you know, the government becomes the big parent, and uh, yet it, the government had a lot to do with us having this mess, uh, and, and we have less personal freedom after all. Okay, this from page 147, 148. Dowd illustrates the great internal contradiction of white liberalism, that its paternalism, its focus on whites rather than on blacks as the agents of change allows white supremacy to slip in the back door and once again define the fundamental relationship between whites and blacks. So the very structure of the liberal faith that whites and society must facilitate black uplift locks white liberals into an unexamined white supremacy. They can't really believe in blacks, but they must believe in whites. Whites are agents, blacks are agented. Post-60s American liberalism preserves the old racist hierarchy of whites over blacks as a virtue itself, and it grants all whites who identify with it a new superiority. In effect, it says you are morally superior to other whites and intellectually superior to blacks. The white liberal's reward is this feeling that because he is heir to the knowledge of the West, yet morally enlightened beyond the West's former bigotry, he's really a new man, a better man than the world had seen before. So he's talking about how the white liberal... Uh, benefits from this issue of white guilt. And on page 177, he says, today most of our conservative people in the, war, in the West sound a lot like Martin Luther King. So that's quite an interesting observation as well. If there's anything systemic 
today. It's the intention of this woke movement to replace, to utterly, utterly destroy and replace the civilization we presently have with kind of a new revolution, a totally different way of doing things, a new kind of totalitarianism. They want to replace America with a neo-Marxist social justice technocratic utopia, a neo-fascistic new order that is both totalitarian and unfree. So in his book, Steele has outlined the mechanism by which both whites and blacks have contributed to this terrible situation. Social justice, as it's presently playing out, is mostly a scam. It is a movement away from character and merit to vague, unfalsifiable notions of systemic bias and prejudice. Whites to restore waning moral authority, do everything they can to disassociate themselves from racism or even the charge of racism. And so whites sing the song of diversity, inclusion, equity, cancel culture, and position themselves as the vanguard to making the world just a wonderful, better place, hey. Unless you're Asian, then you're too smart, you're, you're in a different category. The Asians are white supremacists, they say. And with all these new arrangements set up now, we're on this road of equity. We're gonna solve this by, again, changing not, not, not the baseline, but the outcome. And equity becomes the primary value in social morality. We all go backwards instead of forwards. And so the educational system, the government, all these pieces, the institutions of the culture, they're all kind of getting co-opted by this, this crazy convergence of pieces. If we're not careful, we're even going to find the churches completely compromised. In fact, I would go so far as to say we're facing a convergence of forces that potentially would uh, destroy, will destroy this civilization. Yeah, that's the big deal. The people on the left are, are morally superior. The people on the right are morally inferior. You know, you have the Neanderthals and you have the new man. And we sort of see those kind of attitudes today. Again, not, not really helpful uh, for unity and peace and goodwill in the country. There's a lot more of this on page 151 about the red states and the blue states and this disassociation from the solid American values and how that plays out. So on page 159, he talks about this sort of deal that was kind of struck, again, which we've just talked about, where, you know, uh, we're going to relieve uh, blacks or minorities of responsibility and we're going to fix things by whatever it is, reparations, giving them money, giving them lower entrance requirements, lower test scores required. Uh, we'll give them the vaccine first and all that business. Um, we're trying to make, you know, right these ancient wrongs. But anyway, he says this is a deal made of what is low and cowardly in both races. And that's a very interesting analysis. And again, the title of his book is White Guilt, How Blacks and Whites Together Destroyed the Promise of the Civil Rights Era. Very interesting, and I think useful for us. Sadly, useful for us. So, still recording. What are we going to say? Good book. Good insights. Lots here, way better than a lot of these other business that we're getting now. Uh, some really strong insight. Again, America's not totally bad. Uh, what we have then is uh, a sharp shift in values, uh, a sharp departure from individual morality to towards social morality. And then we have everybody virtue signaling up here that, you know, we're better than you are because we're doing this for this minority, we're doing this for that minority. And uh, so we have really kind of an acid that is, that is permeating and destroying society. Uh, Steele's book is quite good. White Guilt, a good book, useful, uh, in contrast to the one I'll review very soon in Woke, The Woke Danger Number 5. See ya.